Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I offer an update on the case of Abigail Zwerner and the lawsuit that she filed against the Newport News School Board? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. A few of my recent pre-release Patreon videos have enigmatic titles like Unwanted Advanced Murder, Truck Ramming Homicide, and Failure to Report. In addition, I have over 150 other videos available on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to a summary of the lawsuit, then offer my analysis. On January 6, 2023, a 25-year-old first grade teacher named Abigail Zwerner was teaching her class at Richneck Elementary School in Newport News, Virginia, when she was shot by a six-year-old student. The bullet passed through her left hand and into her upper chest. Abigail escorted her 18 students out of the classroom as another employee restrained the six-year-old shooter. Abigail was the last person to leave the classroom. After getting her students to safety, she collapsed in the school office. None of the students were injured. Only Abigail was injured. Abigail was transported to a hospital with life-threatening injuries. She was in stable condition by January 8 and released in mid-January to recover at home. Abigail underwent at least four surgeries and bullet fragments remained in her body. The six-year-old shooter was sent to a mental health treatment facility and will not be charged with any crime. The gun that he used was a Taurus 9mm semi-automatic pistol, which was legally owned by his mother. An attorney for the shooter's family said that the firearm was secured by a trigger lock. The police made it clear that the shooting was intentional. The six-year-old student had expressed interest in murdering his teacher. He previously stated that he wanted to set her on fire. In early April 2023, Abigail Zwerner filed a $40 million lawsuit against the Newport News School Board. Also in early April 2023, the mother of the six-year-old shooter was indicted for felony neglect and a misdemeanor count of recklessly leaving a firearm so as to endanger a child. The student's mother may not be the only person in trouble. Prosecutors have asked the judge to impanel a special grand jury to investigate security issues that may have contributed to the shooting. Now moving to a summary of the lawsuit. The lawsuit contains accusations against the school board and three employees. It's important to remember that these are just allegations. This case has not yet been tested in a court of law. Much of the summary I will provide has been paraphrased. At the time of the incident, Abigail Zwerner was a 25-year-old teacher at Richneck Elementary School in Newport News, Virginia. The lawsuit names not only the school board, but the superintendent of the school district, the principal of Richneck Elementary School, and the assistant principal. The lawsuit refers to the six-year-old shooter using the placeholder name John Doe. The real name of the student has never been released. I will use the same placeholder in this summary. John Doe had a history of violent behavior, of which school officials were aware. He attacked both students and teachers. His aggression was directed toward anyone in his path, and his intent was to cause injury. John Doe's violent behavior was not confined to school. He was also violent at home. During the 2021-2022 school year, John Doe attempted to strangle a teacher and was removed from Richneck Elementary School. The lawsuit states that he strangled the teacher, but technically the word strangled implies that someone was killed, which was not the case here. He attempted to strangle. During the same school year, John Doe approached a female child who had fallen on the playground, pulled her dress up, and made inappropriate contact. John Doe was sent to an early childhood center and allowed to return to Richneck Elementary School in the fall of 2022. He was a first grade student. John Doe was on a modified schedule because he chased students around the playground with a belt and cursed at school employees. Part of the schedule involved one of his parents being with him during the school day. Teachers at the school approached administrators multiple times expressing concern about John Doe's behavior. He was frequently taken to the school office only to return to the classroom not long afterward in the possession of a reward, like a piece of candy. John Doe's parents would not agree for him to be placed 
into a special education classroom. On January 4, 2023, John Doe grabbed Abigail Zwerner's cell phone and refused to return it to her. He slammed the phone on the ground. It cracked and shattered as a result. Abigail took John Doe to the lead teacher, who in turn called security, but security never showed up. At this point, the guidance department was notified. When a guidance counselor named Rolanzo arrived, John Doe referred to all the employees there as blanks. It was a word that rhymes with witches. He was suspended for one day, so he could not come to school on January 5. On his first day back after the suspension, January 6, John Doe was brought to the school by his mother, but she left. This, of course, was inconsistent with the plan which had been put in place. John Doe was supposed to be accompanied by a parent at all times. Between 11.15 and 11.30 a.m., when John Doe was at lunch, Abigail approached the assistant principal and told her that John Doe was in a violent mood. He had threatened to physically attack a kindergarten student at lunch and stared down a security guard. According to Abigail and another teacher who was in the office, the assistant principal ignored Abigail and did not even bother looking up. The lawsuit goes on to suggest that the assistant principal had a reputation for downplaying concerns expressed by teachers and demeaning teachers. She would routinely give candy to students who were sent to her office for violent behavior. Moving back to the timeline, at 11.45 a.m., two students approached a reading specialist named Amy and told her that John Doe was in the possession of a firearm. He had it in his backpack. Amy asked John Doe if he had a gun in his backpack. He stated that he did not, but he would not let her take the backpack. He claimed that he was angry that people were picking on one of his classmates. Before recess, which started at 12.30 p.m., Abigail saw John Doe take something out of his backpack and put it in the pocket of his hoodie. She was concerned that it might be a weapon. During recess, Amy, the reading specialist, searched John Doe's backpack, which had been left in the classroom. She did not find a weapon. Amy went to the assistant principal and told her that Abigail had seen John Doe remove an object from his backpack before recess. The assistant principal told Amy that John Doe's pockets were too small to hold a handgun. Not long after 1 p.m., when recess ended, a teacher named Jennifer approached a student who had been seen at recess with John Doe and asked him about the interaction. The student told her that John Doe had shown him a firearm. Jennifer kept the student in her classroom because he was afraid of John Doe. Jennifer called the school office. A music teacher named John answered the phone. Jennifer told John about what she'd learned. John responded that he would inform the assistant principal. At 1.11 p.m., John called Jennifer back and told her that the assistant principal was aware of the threat, but John Doe's backpack had already been searched. Jennifer repeated her concern that John Doe had a gun. The guidance counselor, Rolanzo, stopped by Jennifer's classroom. She informed him of what was going on. He went to the assistant principal and asked for permission to search John Doe for a firearm. At the same time, John, the music teacher, told the assistant principal that Jennifer believed that John Doe had a gun. The assistant principal said that John Doe's mother would be arriving soon to pick him up. She denied Rolanzo's request. Less than an hour later, at 1.59 p.m., while Abigail was seated at a reading table in her classroom, John Doe pulled a pistol out of his pocket and shot her one time. The lawsuit asserts that the school board was reckless, negligent, and grossly negligent, and requests $40 million in compensatory damages. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. In March of 2023, Abigail was interviewed by NBC Today host Savannah Guthrie. During the interview, Abigail talked about the shooting a little bit. She recalled how the student pointed a gun at her and fired. She said, quote, There are some things I'll never forget, and I will just never forget the look on his face that he gave me while he pointed the gun directly at me. That's something I will never forget. It changed me. It changed my life, unquote. 
Abigail never directly described a look, but I think the implication is that it was a look of anger and or hatred. The six-year-old boy had a history of violence and clearly wanted to kill Abigail. It's disconcerting and terrifying to think that a six-year-old could give a look this frightening and actually try to kill his teacher. Which brings me to item number two. How could a six-year-old have become this aggressive? In this particular case, it's been reported that the student had an acute disability, but there's not a lot known about what exactly was going on. Let's take a look at what the research tells us in general about children who become aggressive. Several predictors of aggression and other antisocial behavior in children have been identified in the research literature. Here are a few variables that predict aggression. Growing up in poverty, having parents who have a low educational level, having parents who are depressed or antisocial. Interestingly, a mother's antisocial behavior is a much more powerful predictor than antisocial behavior in a father. Living in a single parent household, especially if the single status starts prior to the child's birth, as opposed to the parents separating after the child is born. Having a mother who had her first child when she was very young. Having a mother that did not graduate from high school and having a mother who smoked and drank during pregnancy. The smoking in particular is a powerful predictor of aggression. One theory about physical aggression in children is that most children are physically aggressive during infancy, but through proper supervision, they learn alternatives to aggression before they enter school. One could think of it like narcissism. Most people start narcissistic and their narcissism reduces before it becomes problematic. Becoming narcissistic is not the problem. Failing to lose the narcissism is the problem. I think this stresses the importance of competent supervision. Children need to have parents who will enforce rules. Moving back to the case of the six-year-old shooter, one theme that emerged here was how he was not well supervised. Reports stated that he would roam the halls of the school in the day, and he did not appear to receive any discipline. Quite the opposite, he would get candy instead of punishment when he was sent to the school office. This was only reinforcing his bad behavior. There is the sense that the six-year-old was just doing whatever he wanted to. He was using expletives, striking people, attempting to strangle people, and committing other offenses, but there didn't seem to be any consequences. It's almost like the school administrators were just tired of hearing about his behavior. They wanted to pretend that everything would work out if they ignored him. The assistant principal allegedly disregarded multiple warnings that the six-year-old had a gun. The assistant principal's response right before the shooting epitomizes the lack of attentiveness and poor reasoning skills evident throughout this case. She was trying to pass the problem off to the boy's mother, saying that the mother would be at the school soon to pick up the boy. It was almost like she was saying, he is somebody else's problem. Even if somehow the assistant principal believed that the boy would not use the gun, which of course was an inaccurate conclusion, how was this a solution to the long-term problem? This was a very short-sighted strategy. There was a risk of the student bringing the gun in the next day and any day after that. It's difficult to understand what the assistant principal could have possibly been thinking. Now moving to my final item, number three. In April 2023, Abigail Zwerner was honored by the Virginia State Senate for heroic actions. She was given a framed resolution commending her for her devotion to the safety of her students. In my opinion, there is absolutely no question that Abigail Zwerner is a hero. In the moment of action, while suffering from the horrible trauma and pain of being shot, her first thought was for the safety and well-being of her students. They were screaming in terror. They had no idea what to do. It was Abigail who protected them from harm. It was Abigail who, while severely wounded, stepped up to be a leader. Her warnings of danger had been disregarded, but this did not erode her determination to keep her students safe. Abigail was not confused about what happened. She knew that she had been shot. She knew that she could die. She was undoubtedly aware that the six-year-old could shoot her again. Yet, concern for her students was her prime motivator 
and she did not permit anything to stand in the way of protecting them. That is my update on the case of Abigail Zwerner. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.